South Sudan is a hopeful young country, but their scars are felt around the globe. The world's youngest nation has been through so much, a raging civil war and tribal conflicts, drought, famine, and an inconceivable lack of development. But all across the map, and especially in one specific country, there's been a much needed glimpse of hope for the entire South Sudanese population. Basketball. Yeah, a game. One that we take for granted so often, but can literally change nations and shake the social and political fabrics of the world. And over the last 20 so years, mainly between the years of 2001 and 2007, thousands and thousands of Sudanese fled across the world to escape the conditions at home, many of which ended up over 11,000 kilometers away in Australian cities across the country. Now the South Sudanese Australians have put together a community that's close, welcoming, incredibly positive, and talented as hell. We came here as refugees, man. Like, this is a second chance for us to, you know, make it in life. While it's finally being showcased on the world scale, it's what they're doing and have been doing for the last two decades that impresses so much. It's definitely a small community, with under 0.06% of the Aussie population being of South Sudanese descent. But it's powerful, like 12% of Australian hoopers playing NCAA basketball and 10% of Australia's NBL league come from South Sudanese families. Crazy proportions. So we spent three weeks in Australia diving into what makes the community run, why it's grown so quickly, and how it's already changed so many lives of not only South Sudanese Australians, but those back home too. Basketball, what it means to Sudanese community, it brings people together. You know, especially come from a well known country. That little rock band, it brings everybody together, it unites people, it makes people happy. This is Grow the Game. To see, it takes a lot to like go to the next level. So yeah. you just give up in a way. Like that's a big thing. That's what, that's what fucks up a lot of people not having the opportunity. It goes to street, street life. Yeah. 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 Don't don't go Don't. Oh wow. Yeah. 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 So like, for example, my situation, I have a contract. I always got a house to go to. Yeah, family. true. It's a family house for life. Is that how most families are? Yeah, like that's how most of those families are like, basically. Damn. One big, one big house where everybody lives. And then now, you know, my mom opened the doors up to my auntie to come and live. And now I did five more people in the house. And that's like, what, 16 people in the house? Bro. But it's like, you know, it's just, it's just hard work. That's just this, this Sudanese life, I think. Right? Just what it's built on. Yeah, just built on just hard work, trying to create better opportunities. And because of this super family-oriented culture, and really just parents wanting nothing but the best for their kids, basketball really wasn't something to take seriously for most South Sudanese parents. Yeah, most of us, you know, our parents wouldn't support us. You know, they wanted us to like study. You know, study was number one priority. It wasn't really our focus. It wasn't the main thing for us because they didn't see that you could do this. You can do this with basketball. You know. I mean, put yourself in their shoes. You escape from a war-torn country to a land of vast opportunity, and your kid tells you they want to give everything they have to this new game they're picking up? I probably think they're crazy too. I used to want to email schools all the time. I used to come to my brother so Sunday and solo, like, yo, I got the school here, we need this much money. They always told me, you're not ready. My mom is like, nah, it's not good. But us, we don't have a parent, we don't have parents actually supporting us, you know, like they don't come to our games. Sometimes they can't pay our fees for us, you know, that's the same as me growing up. I couldn't pay fees one season. Because of this, many of these players, even the ones at the highest level, started hooping super late in their childhood. And then, yeah, I picked up the game pretty late. Back home, everybody, like, playing soccer pretty much, so I didn't know much about basketball growing up, so. I mean, Don Maker started at 14. Duop Reed started at 15. Manny started at 17. Because although it wasn't really a common route at first, at some point, it's kind of hard to avoid the game, especially if you have a natural build to be a hooper, like a lot of these guys and girls do. So a lot of kids fell in love with the game anyways. Just one day, my brother was hooping, you know, and then he was like, look, let's go to the courts, and it was too hot to play out outdoors, and I was like, fair enough, man, let's go, and just fell in love with it right away. And in a weird way, starting late seemed to often give an extra fire to these players who'd have to work even harder to catch up in terms of their skills and their IQ. 
Obviously my brother as well, just pushing me every day to get better, wake up at 6 a.m. And you know, he always made sure I had a chip on my shoulder, always made sure that like, I had to keep working hard because I, was, I started way later than everyone. He's like, well, you gotta put in double the effort. So now you have players in the game with the drive to make up for lost time and the physical tools to be something special. It was only a matter of time before the final missing piece, role models. I think the biggest reason why parents weren't supported before is because not many Susu and these hoopers had made it like that. Or, you know, basketball wasn't a thing that they saw as a way out. As we see all the time in every single hoops culture we go to, if you trace it back far enough, it just takes one, that first one to make it out. There's just something so incredibly potent about seeing someone from your same background actually conquer the dream. Seeing someone that looks like you and pretty much come from where you come from and knowing that you actually have the capability of actually getting there one day. What really sparked in Australia the most was when, um, when I thought America got drafted, you know. With the 10th pick in the 2016 NBA Draft, the Milwaukee Bucks select Thon Maker. And Perth, Australia. A lot of family, like our parents decided like opening up to basketball more. Growing up, my, my basketball idols was definitely uh, Thon Maker. Seeing him get drafted, that just showed me from the jump, like someone, you know, he, I can make it too. Because this is somebody who came from the same place I'm from, grew up how I grew up. And for him to get drafted top 10 in the NBA, that was big time for me. Coming up as like a young kid for me, like, looking at Thon Maker or Luau Deng, for example, like what he done in, um, for South Sudanese, South Sudanese community and the people from South Sudan, like it meant a lot. Dwight Reed, that's another guy from Perth who you know I grew up with and seeing him make it to the NBA and seeing his journey is really inspiring. Guys like Matua Maker, Maku Maker, it just shows you that anything's possible. And this doesn't even have to be players who make the NBA. It's the ones who get a free education in the States. All the Sudanese that go to play America basketball, that inspires a lot of the youth generation here, so they all become figures, they all become idols, you know. It's the influx of South Sudanese hoopers in the NBL, just over a decade after many arrived to Australia. About six years ago, I think that's when the first, very first few uh, those made the NBL uh, with Majuk Majuk, with the Perth Wildcats, uh, Majuk Dang, then also Sunday Dutch. I think those were the very few, first few those back in 20, 2015, 2016. We only make up a small population in, in Australia, so to see that many pseudos, it's, it's inspiring. You know, people come up to me all the time, you know, tell me how I'm a role model to them. Um, obviously, it's hard for me to see, but when they come and tell me stuff like that, um, it's a really eye opener and it just makes me want to go harder. This is truly clearing out the road to success and making a visible, attainable path for not only young hoopers, but parents to see that, hey, maybe there's something here. With Sunday's recent success and a lot of South Sudanese pro hoopers, our parents are starting to see, okay, you can actually make a way out of this and do something. Success of um, guys like Dwight Reed, success of some of the guys in NBL like Sunday Dutch, I think it's, it's, made, it's made a big difference and it made a big change in the way they perceive basketball now and, and they actually see it as a way out and a way for them to provide for their families. You know, that's where I got my inspiration from. And just like um, seeing like my community playing basketball, you know. But like we just don't have that support group for us, you know. And we, we, we need an idol. We've got things like my brother, but we need more pseudo idols so that we can look up to and actually say, yeah, I want to be like that. I want to be like my brother Solo, he's an agent. I want to be like Sunday, who's in the NBL, you know. I want to be like Wenyan Gable in the NBA. Like we need more idols like that, you know. Man, if we want to talk about idols, a new standard has been set. This past summer, just over 10 years after becoming the world's youngest nation, the South Sudan national team qualified for the Olympics at the FIBA World Cup. Five Aussie players, including Sunday, traveled to Manila to accomplish the impossible. Something I never knew um, would bring so much joy and happiness from, not just for myself, but for my countrymen and women, my mom and dad. And with no indoor gym in the entire country, a much more difficult route to funding, and a country torn by tribalism and unimaginable misfortune, this success came out of nowhere. We came crazy back home, you know what I mean? Like, it was just a matter of time that Ibu could have someone that could actually, you know, bring like, bring the nation together. Like, Luol Deng, for example, what he did was great, you know, he got the whole nation to back. When people used to talk about South Sudan, no one really knew about our background, but all they just see is war. And I would understand, me being born in Australia, looking from that side, I would understand just seeing war. I've never been to Africa, I've never been to South Sudan myself, you know, so I had a fear factor like, oh, it's war torn, there's always issues there, that's why we're out here. But like, seeing the basketball team do what they did, and like seeing how South Sudan's united, man, like even my mom, like my mom's dropping tears, you know, my mom's never seen me play basketball. 
And this is truly a testament to the work of people like Lu Walt Dang and others behind this huge undertaking that at times, I'm sure felt like a task too immense to accomplish. You know, now, now South Sudan is, uh, is recognized worldwide when it comes to basketball. Luol even personally funded the team at first and has been investing into the Australian grassroots for a long time now. And man, it's paying off. Because when you're playing for an entire nation and its people around the world on a level much higher than a game, anything can happen. Seeing South Sudan's success, it's like the violence stops, just like Royal Ivy and, um, and Luau Dango said, so the violence really stops. Everyone's really watching the game together. Everyone's zip quiet, just cheering for their own country. The, tri the tribalism is out the way. We just know we're South Sudanese people at the end of the day. It's not really about what's happening on the court and how many points we're winning by, but it's about the whole country being behind the team and bringing everybody in and nobody have to worry about the tribalism or anything like that. It's not even about basketball. It just like, it just elevates the whole country, you know, like we now we're known pretty much everywhere. This is the psyche of the country. I mean, these are countries that's been through war. You know, we've gone through political turmoil over the last 50 years, 60 years. So many people migrated out of the country, went to Europe, went to the United States, went to Australia. The fact that we had a team that rose up so quickly and became now number one in Africa, it changes the mindset of the country. You know, like uh, people think, okay, well, if we, can, we, can, we can be number one in basketball in Africa, that means we can be number one in so many other things, you know? And uh, just being on the world map, man, just going to the, and competing uh, against other countries, it just puts the country on the, on the world map and uh, everyone is just so proud. And we can only imagine where this will take the spirit of South Sudanese hoops culture in Australia, with more families on board and a massive wave of pride and hoops energy engulfing the community. The future is bright. <laughs> But still, when you zoom back into the Australian hoops community, there remains an unfortunate, hazy image of South Sudanese hoopers that creates some politics at every level. Basically, there are a lot, of, a lot of hurdles they have to go through that a lot of our parents don't really understand or the wider community. They would perceive us as, you know, we're just athletic, you know, but we don't, we don't think the game. We think the game, like, you know, our parents are not involved in that game. And I think there is political. It's like, I think being around certain coaches, um, not specifically what I've been through, but I've heard stories of, like, them being put in a box, like, oh, it's just another Sudanese player. Like, we're not looking at them as an individual or as an athlete. It's just shameful in the world of sport. I feel like... In sport, you shouldn't be just judged on your ability, you know, and what you bring to the table. These are conversations that aren't easy. I wish I didn't have to talk about them, but they can't be avoided. In pretty much any country, if you make up less than 1% of the population, you look different than the majority of people, you're typically in a lower socioeconomic bracket, and you can hoop or you have potential, there's going to be some friction there. For me, it was just uh, trying to make it, make it, making a team and being accepted to the club. Being accepted, yeah. Yeah, I think that was the biggest one. The people who you hang out with on, on a day-to-day -day basis, maybe the media coverages about South Sudanese people, uh, maybe limits your, your chances of playing in the state level or at the national level. It's really political, you know, political in a sense where we're sort of... Um, Say, for example, you know, I don't want to bring race out and things like that. But say, for example, there's a pseudo kid and just um, a non pseudo hooper. If they had both the same skills and one was taller and could still show guard skills, they would throw him in a big position or they'll throw him out of position. Or they would pick the non, the non pseudo hooper and want to develop him, even though the ceiling is evidently different, you know. But I guess that's his parents talking to coaches, making relationships like that. You know, when your parents won the game, yeah. you know, and the club sees your parents playing, all that yeah, stuff. Exactly. Well, yeah, most of us, they, you know, our parents wouldn't support us. For example, like and play for the state team, like I reckon it's all about like politics. Um, and yeah. And it definitely rips opportunities from young, promising hoopers. And growing up with all this pushing back against the sport you love so much, it's human nature to start thinking, what am I doing this all for? Is there an easier route? I think um, the alternative raps comes from the obstacles, you know? A lot of kids, um, you know, they, they face the financial barriers, the politics, they just, they give up. They give up quick and then they choose the, the easy life, the street life, they go trap. And then, um, and, it, and in turns, it hurts the whole community because then now they're taking, you know, guys who are trying to make it out, guys who are on the right path, such as one of my best friends, Alir, who was, you know, was on this right path. He was out celebrating his birthday in Melbourne when he was um, murdered, which was, you know, it took, it took a toll on the whole community, not only the South Sudanese community, but the basketball community in Australia as a whole. But if there's one thing I learned about this community, they persevere. In fact, they use it to their advantage. So politics, tainted images, all that, 
That ain't stopping the vast majority of people. Because of this, the growth has been exponential. It's only getting better throughout the years. Um, you know, more kids are getting opportunities to play state. More um, kids are getting opportunities to represent Australia. So, this, like I said before, the sky's the limit. Um, and a couple years from now on, um, a South Sydney is going to be a pop. And part of what continues to keep this spark alive is the tight knit community that's been built through the years. South Sydney's community in itself in Australia is really small and really know each other. So the hoops community makes it even smaller. Why is that? Just being together, you know, togetherness, you know, um, supporting one another, you know what I'm saying? Just knowing that, you know, we're a minority here, so you know, we always we, we try to help each other out in the, in the best way we can, you know. That's why we're so close together. We all come from the same struggle and we're all trying to make it out together, you know. And it's just a snapshot of togetherness, but if you're a hooper, you know that open runs like this around the world work magic to bring people together. Especially in small communities like this, it's kind of the root of quote unquote, everybody knowing everybody. It's a safe space for people to compete, argue, laugh, and chop it up about basketball and life alike, which is the perfect well-rounded recipe to building lifelong friends and gelling a community that sticks together through any barrier. About everyone's traveling from, everyone travels 40 minutes, 50 minutes, uh, this is the best run that we get on Friday nights at KGV. Now it's off season. You see, you see all the guys all happy and good to see each other. So it's every 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 summertime we, we get together and have an elite run. Here. You know, doing small stuff like this, small events where you know kids can come, teenagers can come and play against grown men. Um, they only develop the game. And just a few days later, we experienced the same thing. This time in an even more close knit community in the western suburbs of Melbourne not many opportunities out there for us so we kind of just have to create our own way which is why I started Elevate to try to create another pathway. I had the dreams of making it professionally but didn't always work out so kind of just turned into creating my own business in basketball. I um, started training a few friends. Um, it was actually my mom that encouraged me to turn into more into a business. The community was behind me when I turned into a business and eight years later here we are. Doing runs like this and having a place like this for the pseudo community specifically um, it's a safe haven for a lot of the guys here. So a lot of people here, they feel comfortable. They can be who they are under one roof without having to worry about being judged. So that's, I think that's one of the best things that we can actually cover. And the best thing about runs like this, they're five, 10 bucks, if not free, which makes it much more of a possibility for hoopers to get quality competition and spend time in that safe haven for a few hours. Because for many pseudo hoopers, the pay to play nature of hoops can become a massive hurdle. Playing basketball in, uh, as a South Sudanese hooper is, um, first of all, there's a financial barrier. Because of language barriers and a lack of connections and formal education, it's tougher to find high paying work for South Sudanese families. So many of South Sudanese descent will work factory jobs, drive Uber, do social work, and work other blue collar jobs, which are definitely stable enough to get by, especially in a country like Australia. But with a median income that's only about 66% of the average countrywide income, a big investment into basketball just isn't much of a possibility especially with families that often have tons of kids to take care of. Much of my parents, they don't have much work, much money, so it's hard to sort of invest in your kids' basketball dreams when, you know, you haven't really seen much for it or you don't really see what's going to come from it. And you, you got other kids to prioritize, other things to work, worry about. So first is the financial barrier. Um, in my family, I've got three brothers and we all play basketball, so like, my financially, it was tough for my parents. Um, trying to pay for all of us because I was playing reps, my older brother was playing reps and my little brother was coming up to start playing reps, but like just me and my older brother alone, it was pretty tough for my parents. But as I've learned in traveling to so many different hoops communities, there will always be passionate, intelligent people out there looking to fill in gaps and elevate the community, which is exactly what Coach Manny and the Longhorns program here in Melbourne has done. We're based in the western suburbs of Melbourne, so we compete, yeah, we play in tournaments. Uh, you know, we've got junior age groups, we start, we've got under 12s, under 14s, under 16s, under 18s, all the way to seniors. So I wanted to give back. We started off with one under 18 team, then we went to an under 16, an under 14, and then just kept developing it like that, you know, over the years. So it's important to understand here that normal domestic teams can run you thousands and state teams even more. So programs like this that are based around these minority populations and keep that hurdle in mind 
relieve this financial barrier to entry, and as a result, have elevated many players to new levels of their basketball careers. Through Longhorns, he actually helped a lot of us through basketball, so, so he's produced like a lot of the guys who are now playing professionally, as myself, who actually started my own business as well, as a couple of other guys who went to college to get their own degrees. It's a club that has produced so many players over the years. We've got players that are playing high school in the United States, uh, some that are playing in the pros. We've got other kids from other cultural backgrounds, but uh, the way Longhorn started was um, mainly started off with uh, a lot of the South Sudanese kids, uh, South Sudanese Australian kids, and um, you know it, it means a lot in the community because this is where a lot of uh, the players they've uh, they've come out of uh, this uh, this club. I mean, some of the big names that have come out of the club are uh, Mango Mathia, uh, Dengadel as well. We we have about seven players that have played for the South Sudan national team and the team captain for the South Sudan na uh, national team, Kwani Kwani, uh, is a Longhorns alumni. So to see some of the guys that were at the club here go, go uh, rise up and go to college, uh, get their degrees, get to play for South Sudan national team and also get an opportunity to play for the, for the Boomers. So, you know, so the, the, the club means a lot to the, to the community out here in Melbourne. So we've got a few tournaments uh, in Australia here that uh, the boys look forward to. And one of these tournaments that Coach Manny is referring to is this one. Definitely, yeah, definitely the best tournament. This is by far the best tournament in Australia that I play. Probably the best tournament in the country right now. Well, this footage is from a few years back, and you'll see why. But I don't think its significance can be captured in an interview. The crowd was insane, you know what I mean? Now, the energy is insane. The atmosphere in there is just, like it's, electrifying. Yeah, it's like AU, it's like playing AU ball. Yeah. But just, just imagine your own people there, right? And just loud as hell, it's, it's here. So it's, it's, yeah, there's nothing like the success in this tournament. The Sasha News told me it was big. I mean, it brought out college coaches from America. Like one year, had TCU come out and actually play Longhorns. It was it was huge. It was you know, a lot of guys got their first um, first college offers, first um, first looks from from the South Sudanese tournament. So it was big, and then the impact in the community. It just brought everyone together, united everybody. Everybody would have something to look forward to every. Every, every six months, you know, it was something big. And it helped a lot of kids, like, we attracted so many coaches from the States, coming all over to Australia, like Lee College, they yeah. came all the way to watch Dwarf, those guys. Uh -huh. That's when this tournament really influenced a lot of, like, a lot of us, man. And that's when our parents also started supporting us more, you know, encouraging us to play basketball, because they started seeing the, seeing how many, the amount of, like, attraction it was getting, you know, the attention was getting, you know. Even our basketball still was involved, which was huge, you know. But, unfortunately, in recent years, state governments have suppressed the tournament a bit. The, the Victorian government, the Victorian Council, uh, sort of banned the South Sudanese tournament from some Ego Stadium not happening no more due to the violence that they thought it was bringing. Which sometimes, you know, I, I believe it didn't bring no violence. It was just violence in and around the stadium, but it wasn't directly caused from the South Sudanese tournament. Which I think it was unfair to the rest of the community and the rest of the South Sudanese hoopers. As an outsider, I'm obviously not the guy to speak on what's the right and the wrong decision, but with so much impact and so many lives changed through this tournament, it's unfortunate that it was taken out of its home because of some events unrelated to the tournament. So hopefully it'll return to what it was, but I know one thing for sure. This is just another example of this community not letting anything stop them. And I've been around a lot of people in the last few years, a lot of different cultures, values, and mindsets. And there's something special within the South Sudanese culture that just breeds and spreads positivity that just naturally encourages people to control the controllable. And it makes sense. Even now, almost all these hoopers were either refugees or children of refugees who don't take anything for granted. They're in a country that's their adopted home and often with their backs inherently against the wall a bit. And now that basketball is a proven path to glory and providing for families, it's go time. Basketball here in Australia for the South Sudanese community is only evolving. I think the rest of the world has kind of woken up with South Sudanese hoopers. I think now a lot more opportunities are going to be given to South Sudanese hoopers because they know that we're not only just athletic, we're, only, we're also talented and can play at the highest level. Having an older brother that's made it, having another brother that's in the business side and having a cousin that's made it, I feel like I'm fortunate enough to be around it and understand that like you could really change people's lives with this game. I wouldn't be surprised one bit if we see 8 to 10 pseudo-Australians in the NBA in 10 years. Probably even more. But just as importantly, I'm sure we'll be seeing them all around the business of basketball and growing the game around the world.
When you first start, right, you, you don't know where you're going to be, you don't know where you're going to get to, like everyone's got aspirations to to make the NBA, you know, and, and reach the heights of, of your skill set and like along the way, you know, it's it starts out of as just about you and the game, but then as you get older and the more years you play, you realise like you affect so many people around you, you know, and, and, and that's kind of been a huge part of it, you know, just the more years I've played, the more I've realised like this has actually afforded me to, you know, live like a really good life, you know, provide for myself, my family and post basketball, you don't know, there's other avenues too, there's commentating, there's coaching, there's skills training like, like Cole here, so like there's just, there's just a lot of opportunities in basketball that when you first start, like you, you don't know those doors are going to open, but then once they're open, like you're appreciative and you realise like, hey man, just the hard work I did as a kid and all those 6am sessions I do with my brother before school, like they're paying off and these are the fruits of their labour. Because yes, of course, the physical tools are there. So is the passion, growing infrastructure, the hard work, and now the proof of what can be done at all levels and all pockets of the game of basketball. So stay on the lookout. This community is something special, and it's only growing from here. I know, but I